I've just uh, really humbled this morning by this word that the Lord has given me to share with this generation, and I hope it'll go out from here, and, uh, and, and kids, youth that are about to step into their place in the world would heed these words. Uh, it's about the decade of the breakthrough. We're living in what the rabbis call uh, the decade of the breakthrough. I'd like for you to turn to uh, Mark chapter 5, if you would. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 20. Uh, excuse me, Lord. Starting in verse 24. Uh, huh. Not Matthew. I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong book here. Okay, you can tell I had a team meeting yesterday. Okay, stand for the reading of the word, if you would. Starting in verse 24, a, a man comes to Jesus and said, "His daughter is very sick." Verse 24. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. And now a certain woman who had a, a blood a fl issue of blood for 20 years, 12 years, and had suffered many things from many physicians, and she had spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd, and she touched his garment, for she had said, if only I may touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You, you see the multitude thronging you all around you. Why do you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. May God all his blessing of the reading of the word. You may be seated. So the part I want to concentrate on today, we teach out of this story a lot. I'm going to borrow Jim's thing here. Man, I got multiple things. It's cool. The, we teach out of this story a lot, but I want to focus on the one thing the, the Bible says. In Matthew, it says, having that the woman having had said that she if she could only touch the hem of his garment in the and the greek syntax tells you that 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 what what they're trying to say is she was in the habit of saying if i can only touch the hem of his garment she set up and she fueled her faith with her confession and she proclaimed out of her mouth if i can touch the hem of his garment i will be healed and she was worse off 12 years, spent all the money she had, been to every doctor there was, been to the Mayo Clinic, been to all the smart places where all the smart people are. And she was actually worse off from their treatments. They not only did they not help her, they made it. She was in a hopeless position. But she got a hold of her faith. And she, she caught herself saying, oh my God, what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to die because nothing worked. No, she grabbed a hold of her faith and she put it in agreement with the word this woman was a scholar, and I, I teach on this all the time. I'm not going to go into it now. But she was basing her confession off Malachi, where he said there's healing in his wings because the word interpreted wings there is the same word that means kanaf, the hem of the garment, wherever the, the strings are that hang off the garment of the talit of the priest. And she was saying that he activates the word. That represents 613 strings. They act, that's one for every commandment in the, in the, in, in, in the Mosaic law. And she, and she knew that the Messiah would activate that word. And so she understood. She had a deep theological understanding of the scripture. And she made that her confession. If I can touch the kanaf while he's wearing it, I'll be healed. So we're in this, what rabbis call the decade of the breakthrough. And there's convergence and alignment, Josiah, in your, in your generation. Yours, yours and Danielle's generation are the generation that are going to see signs and wonders that have not happened until since Acts chapter 2. You're going to be the Acts 2 church, we're in a church that's rising, because you're living in a very special time. In this time that you're living in, there are a couple of things that are really fascinating that are happening. Here's number one, Revelation 15.3, the sing. 
They sing the song of they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and they also sing the song of the Lamb. There is a there is a celebration in heaven over the victory uh, of Jesus over the Babylonian system, and it's marked by an unusual thing. They're singing the song of Moses, and they're singing the song of the Lamb as well. There's a convergence happening. In Gener in Zechariah chapter twelve verse ten, he said, "I'll pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace." and supplication, and they will look on him who they pierced, and yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for the, his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. The fastest growing uh, uh, community of, of, of Christians in the world is in Israel. Messianic Judaism. I've never have figured out what that is exactly because Zola Levitt said, don't call me a Messianic Jew, just call me a Christian. That's what I am. But they come from the Jewish Hebraic tradition, and they're recognizing for the first time that Jesus was the Messiah, and they missed him. And so, and so they mourn because they realize, but they shouldn't mourn too much because Romans says that if they hadn't pierced him, we wouldn't be saved. Listen, they were blinded so we could be grafted in. Can I get a witness out of somebody? Don't fall into the theology of blaming the Jews or replacement theology that some, some Christian sects have done. Listen, we, don't, we, don't, we owe them a tremendous debt. Romans says they were blinded so that we might be grafted in because they had to be the one to make the sacrifice. Christians will begin to realize, though, in this time, this is the, in, the, in the Christian side of it, that they are branches that have been broken up and grafted in. In Romans 11, 19 and 22, you will say then, he says to the church, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you're standing by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Don't be haughty about that, but fear. For if God had not spared the natural branches, why in the world would he spare you if you become rebellious? Come on, somebody. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God at the same time. On those who fail, severity, but on you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. I think that what Paul is trying to say, we shouldn't take our salvation for granted. We shouldn't take the blood that we have received, the grace that we have received for granted, because it's come at great cost. And they sing the song of Moses, and they sing the song of the Lamb, and so there's an, there, there's, we're in the age of an alignment of Christianity and Judaism Christians are starting to understand their Judaic roots for the first time. And part of this has been the alignment that will occur because of the common observance of the feast. And, and as the feast become recognized as not being discontinued, not being a Jewish feast, they're God's feast, they belong to him, it'll be the Moadim. It's the appointed times of God. We've taught on this a hundred times, so you know it. But the Moads of God, the appointed times, I have set dates on my calendar that tell you to be there. We're going to meet together. We had one last week right here, Pentecost. What a fantastic service we had in our, in our new fellowship hall that God gave us the resources to build because he wants us to understand how important the Moedim are, the, 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 the appointed times of God. And the appointed times of God is the unfolding of history and the fulfillment of all the prophetic concerning Jesus. He did everything in conjunction with and synchronized by the appointed times of God, the Passover. The Feast of Trumpets, all of it, all of those are significant. And so what happens is, is that as the church begins to celebrate the Moadim, as they begin to celebrate the appointed times from a Christian perspective, because they understand the Passover, that Christ is our Passover. Paul said and to the church at Corinth, he said, when you celebrate it, you should know what it means. He didn't say don't quit, don't quit. He didn't say quit celebrating. He said, when you do, do it in sincerity and truth. Because you know Christ is our Passover. And so as we, as we go and we, we learn about the, the Hebrew calendar, we learn it's different. Than, so I would have known nothing about the Hebrew calendar if I had to start investigating the Moadim, the appointed times of God, the time when he calls his people to come, that he wants to do a spiritual transaction. He wants to impart something to you on those specific days. And so as we studied those, we begin to learn the differences in the calendar. And we begin to learn how God measures time and that events unfold. And we learn the calendar is a very specific and a very, very important part of God's overall plan of redemption. It gives us clues to where we are. 
And on the Jewish calendar, you know that the years 20, 2010 through 2019 were not 2010 and 2019 on the Jewish calendar. They were years 5770 and 5779, the decade of the 70s on the Jewish calendar. On the Gregorian calendar, our calendar, which was created by Pope Gregory, we're thankful for the Pope. He's a nice brother. He found a really good way to measure time. That's based on the solar cycle. That's great. It's a very accurate way to do it. It's just not the way God does it. God does it by the lunar cycle. We know that. We've taught that a hundred times. And so on the Hebraic calendar, you learn about these basic moon cycles and how important they are, but you learn the dates are very important because God has done historic things on specific dates. For example, we celebrated the blood moons in here on Passover. Do you all remember that? When we celebrated Passover, we ran outside, and there it was, the blood moon. Remember that beautiful thing in the western sky? And then we knew it would again occur again precisely on Tabernacles that year, and we did the same thing. And then the, the, they promised a shift would come because in history, all the big events have happened in 1949 and 50 on the blood moons. That's when Israel was created. And, and you know all of these historic things. The Six-Day War occurred in 67 and 68, and it was a miracle when Israel conquered their Arab, Arab uh, enemies in just like six days. All of these things that have happened in 2015 and 14, we had a political shift that brought was an earthquake politically in the world. And America elected a, a president that had billions of dollars but didn't know how to comb his hair. Hallelujah. But he brought the capital. That was, a, that was also something he did in the succeeding years, which is precisely on a jubilee year. He moved the capital of Israel. He recognized by moving our embassy to Jerusalem that was part of that restoration. It happened specifically on that specific date for a specific reason because there's an unfolding in history and God is in control of it and nothing is random like it appears. God, there's chaos going on all around us. There's always been chaos going around what God is doing. There always has been. And God speaks to it and he brings it to order. Because he's creative. And the way he does is he, ex and now you've been authorized. You've been authorized to go out and begin to speak to things and begin to bring things into order because God is on a specific unfolding of redemption, a specific plan. It's built around the feast days. And you kids are the generation that are going to walk in the power. Or are you going to get run over by it, one of the two? Because you're the generation that understands the importance of what God is doing. Back to the year, the, the decade we've just come out of, the 5770s, the Hebrew word, letter, A-N. In Hebrew, letters have two meanings. They mean a number and they mean a word. And the Hebrew letter A-N that you see up there, it stands for seven or seventies. And the meaning of A-N is to see. See the two little eyeballs at the top? It also means to see. So in the decade of the 5770s, which is our equivalent of 2010 to 2019, in that decade <clears throat> is the decade of vision formation. Say, I got a vision. It's a decade of when God begins to show you things spiritually for your life, for the church, for your community. He begins to build and empower you with vision. And you go out like Joseph and try to make it happen, and it don't happen. <laughs> That's the wilderness time. That's where your faith begins to be strengthened. You learn some things about who you are and who God is, and you learn it ain't that easy. And you learn you have to do things in God's timing. Even though he gave you a great vision, that doesn't mean it's for today. That's why I got so frustrated. God gives me this vision of a hill land. I go out there. I think it's going to be today. Tony Kemp came all the way from Chicago, Illinois. He walks through that door right there. I never met him. And he said, you have a great vision. God gave it to you, but you made the same mistake Joseph made. You thought it was for today. There's a process of preparation. Say, I'm in the process. There's a process of preparation you have to go through for the manifestation of the vision. And here's the other thing. You have to learn how God's timing works by studying his his, his calendar and his unfolding of redemption. And so you're in, the, you're in the decade of the seeing, of the formation of vision, things you want to do with your life, purposes, your noble purpose that you committed to the Lord. And then you move into the 5780s, which is our 2020s, 2020 through 2029. Now we're in the new decade. Now the letter pay, the letter pay, this is a letter that means <clears throat> 80 or 80s. 
We're in the decade of the letter pay, 80 or 80s. And what pay means is mouth or speaking. Oh, this is important. This is an important letter. When God told Moses to go speak to Pharaoh, pay, the word he used. Whenever God refers to powerful confession, whenever he spoke to the water and commanded the seas to be formed, it was the letter pay. Pay is a powerful, powerful word. It means to speak. Now what's crazy about this, about this, this decade of speaking that we're entering into according to the Hebrew calendar, what's crazy is within the Hebrew letter pay, it's constituted and made up of the letter Bay, to go to the next slide. This is the letter Bay. Now the letter Bay is interesting. See, it has the same shape as part of the letter Pay. But the letter, so the letter Bay is embedded in the letter Pay. So you say, well, that's what's the big deal about that? This, the, the alphanumeric value of the letter Bay is 20. 20s. It's convergence. The Gregorian calendar and the Hebrew calendar are in convergence. They're in convergence where they agree on the same thing. And here's crazy. Listen to me now. What does the letter bay mean? What does it mean besides 2 or 20? What it means is it means creation. To create. To create. Listen to what I'm telling you. You have the power in this season that you're stepping into. The things you saw in the decade of the 70s. In the decade of our 10 through 19, in that decade, in the last decade, the things that you saw then, you need to begin to speak and decree now. And this is the decade of the creation. This is what the rabbis call the decade of the breakthrough. It's coming if you're brave enough to call it into existence. But if you get discouraged because you tried that in the last decade when you got out ahead of God and you thought it was for then and you kept trying and trying and you got no results, now the devil's convinced you to quit because you didn't hear nothing from God. You made that vision up. You don't have, he's trying to attack your faith all the time. But if you'll take a stand on the things that you saw in the last decade that you believe God showed you, if you'll speak those now, speak over your children. You speak prosperity over your children. I don't know how they're going to get a college education. Well, talk to Danielle after the service. She just graduated. And they didn't know how she was going to go to college. She had some weird scheme working at Walmart or something. I don't know what it was, but God had a plan for her. And when she got that word, I remember right there, she got that word from the Lord, and he said, I'm going to take care of this. And she, she made an agreement with that. And she quit trying to do her own schemes, whatever they were. And she waited on the Lord. She spoke that forth, and it manifests in her life. This is the decade of speaking. You speak what God has shown you. You'll see it come to pass. If you believe that, say amen. And it works two ways, too. If your confession is no good. Oh, my God, I've been around that this week. I'm like, help me, Lord. People get so negative and their confession gets so not of the spirit. And it's like you look around at their life and you go, I know why. I know why their life is like it is. You're not going to believe this. Your life is the product of your confession. What's that got to do with it? You are made in the image of God. That's what he says in Genesis. In Job chapter 22, verse 28, he said, Thou shalt decree a thing. Thou shalt decree a thing. And it shall be established unto thee. That means that it's not in existence. You're calling for that which is not. You call things that are not as though they are. Because you're made in the image of Christ. In Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37, But I say to you, you'll give an account for every idle word that you speak. You go keep confessing that. And everybody goes, is he talking about cussing? Well, probably. But the main thing I'm talking about here is when you confess negative things, that God wants you to release positive things. And we've just come out of a difficult year where it was easy to confess negative things and hard to confess positive things. But I'm here to tell you that those that did are walking in breakthrough right now. Those that were able to maintain their confession. 
are walking in breakthrough. There's power in assembly when we come together, Matthew 18 and 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything, it shall be done to you by your Father. It's not enough about to agree. When you, go, you agree and you confess together, on Monday, three weeks ago, I guess it's been now, maybe two, it was right after the, the, the anointing of the prophet in Amarillo when he poured out and said this church would be one of the three rivers, the rivers of the glory that God is going to release into the region. Roger and Bill and I came together on that next Monday and said, okay, let's give this a test. Let's try this out. Let's speak to the clouds. We were all desperate for rain. And we said, we come to you, the courts of heaven, God, we come to you. You've decreed this word by the mouth of your prophet. And what we've been talking about is how dry it is. We repent in the name of Jesus. We repent of that. Listen, I'm not talking to you about you denying reality. What we confess should have confessed is it's dry, Lord, and that's not consistent with your word. So we speak forth rain. We speak forth rain and abundance and prosperity on your land, the hill land. We speak it forth, Lord, because it's consistent with what your prophets have said. And we, and we seek a, a restraining order against the devil who is doing the opposite of what you want done here. It's not your will. We know it's not your will. So we speak forth. Guess what happened Tuesday? Some of y'all's cars need to be washed. They look bad. It's the power of creating with your mouth. God, I hope you can get this. Oh, man. You're made in his image. In Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, to be created in his image means this. You know what this means to be created in the image of God? What it means is, is that you can go back and look at how God created everything. He spoke to the chaos. He spoke to the chaos. And he extracted order out of it. And then he made this declaration. It's good. It's good. See, there's potential. How many of you think our nation is in chaos right now? There's enormous potential in the chaos. You have to learn to look for the things you need to extract out of it. How are you going to do it? You're going to do it the way your maker did it because you're created in his image. I'm going to start to call forth a nation that serves Jesus Christ. I'm going to call that forth in Jesus' name. And, and everybody go, well, the atheists, you're running off with this. It's only because we have learned not to. We've not taken authority over anything in the church. We just said, oh, well. The things that I struggle with in my life. Let me t Mandy and I were talking about this before. I'm going to get Mandy in trouble. She gets me in trouble all the time, so I'm getting her in trouble. We're going to pay her back. But my wife, when you say something out of your mouth that's not lining up with what she knows you believe, oh, she right there in the restaurant or whatever, what did you just say? Is that what you really believe? Oh, huh, Mandy. And Mandy goes, you know, they used to drive me nuts, but the other day Dylan said something. I said, is that what you really believe, Dylan? <laughs> you had to be careful about, I'll give, I'm going to give, you're going to be held in account for every idle word you've said over your children. If you call your children stupid, that's what they're going to be. But the worst part about that is, you're going to stand before your creator and he's going to say, why did you do that? Call your children blessed. Call your circumstance victorious. Call your, whatever your struggle is, call your marriage healed. Call your body healed. You do whatever. You don't have to be in denial. I'm not asking you to live in denial. I'm saying you're not going to tolerate the way things are. You're going to create with your mouth the way things should be. Can I get a witness out of somebody? This generation living in this time, the decade of the breakthrough, y'all can build all kind of stuff by creating with your mouth. This is a special anointed time. This has always been true. So, so, so these principles have always been, these principles have always been in effect. But this is a time of a particular emphasis, a particular emphasis on the power of your speech. And the generation, the young generation that learns, my God, I'm telling you what, I tell you this, I can tell you this, you harvest what you speak, whether it's a good crop or a bad crop, because I have harvested both in my life. 
and I could look back. If I understood this when I was 20, come on, somebody. My life would be even, and my life is good because the Lord has saved me, washed me in the blood, and brought me out. But I'm telling you, my life could be so much better generationally if I had known this principle when I was 20 and I had watched over my speech patterns and I had spoke only what was consistent with the Word of God. That's the other thing, too. Don't, if you're not going to spend no time in the Word, your, your confession ain't going to be no good because you don't even know what to say. You have to have a renewed mind, a mind that's been renewed in the Word of God to know what you need to confess. And if you confess the things that are in the word, the angels hear it, they heed it, they perform it. But more than that, you're in the decade where God is calling you to begin to speak to things and begin to extract things. I speak the remnant church risen on the earth and in power and a, and a church that has cultural influence in the name of Jesus where people are coming in droves and becoming healed and finding peace and finding a different way. I speak revival. No, I don't speak revival. I speak awakening to America, an awakening to America where it's staggering how people come. They just come through the door of the church. They don't even know why they're there. They just know they gotta have something. Man, they're everywhere and they're hurting. Can I get a witness out of somebody? The woman said, she had said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. She had charged her faith. Now. There needed to be an action to trigger that. She had to activate that. But she understood the word. She based that on, I told you, on the prophecies of Malachi about the Messiah. And she was well grounded in the word of God. And she was taking a good stand on the word and saying it will manifest. The word will manifest if I do this. And here's the other thing about it. You got to do something. You got to do something. I found some pills the other day I can take that replace the vegetables that I've never eaten. God is awesome. I take three of them. And I'm supposed to have superhuman strength. I don't have the superhuman strength yet, but I'm still hoping because I don't want to eat the stinking vegetables. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. It's probably not going to work. Because you know what God did? He created a system that calls us to do something, to act, to make a confession that's in agreement with the Word of God, and then just jump out and do an act. Do something. Feed somebody. If you're, if you're angry at somebody, bake them a cake. I, I, I don't know what you got to do. I don't know what your thing is. But I'm telling you, this generation that learns to, to believe, to speak, and to act, they are going to see the things that they have seen in the previous decade are going to manifest in this decade of the breakthrough. The heel land has been my guiding thing for a long time. Even Jim and Rhonda know, I, you know, I've been crazy. They, they worried about me too. They thought I spent too much time out in the sun for a long time. But my point is, I'm seeing it happen. I'm seeing it happen. Well, you in here preaching to a church, you shoot a rival in here and not hit nobody. Look, it ain't talk, I'm not talking about crowds. I don't need 10,000 people to believe the vision. I just need 12. If I can get 12 people that are sold out to the vision, I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot more people than 12 in this part of the country, that believe if my people call by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their sin, I'll hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. They believe that. And we're seeing it in the name of Jesus. I'll tell you, I talk to people every day that move here. And the migration that I saw in the vision from New York and from Chicago and all these places, I could never figure out what would make people, I thought maybe they had an atomic bomb in New York or something. In my reasoning, I couldn't understand why people were coming out here from there. And I saw the, the, I saw the, I saw the stock brokers that were wanting to drive, get a job driving a tractor because they wanted peace. They didn't need money. They just wanted peace. And I thought, well, they must, man, something must have happened. You, I could have never envisioned this, this urban, urban exodus because of, because of irrational, crazy thinking of, of political leaders that, that just is so crazy. I got news for you. I have a lot of faith in the human race, but you've got to have cops. <laughs> you have to have police. But this, just this, just this, just this, this, this stupidness. I mean, it's like, it's just like crazy. And so, and so these people are migrating out here. I talked to a brother, one of the churches in Amarillo. We had lunch last week, and he said, "Oh my God!" He said, "It's like, in Amarillo, they have like a two-week 
supply of housing. I mean, when they get a house finished, that you know, they can't, that there's a family waiting to move in it. It's like he said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's people are coming. Where are they coming from? They're coming from New York. They're coming from California. They're coming from Oregon. Who had the Oregon thing? Mitzi. The, the Oregon, guess what? The, the six east counties in the state of Oregon are voting to secede from Oregon and join Idaho. So tell them to just move a little bit further east. They might be all right. Huh? I never dreamed. I could never dream this up. I just saw the people coming here, and they were hungry, and they needed peace. And they needed to go someplace where people knew how to handle adversity and where people knew how to, how to create the kind of community, the kind of place. What have you been saying? What have you been saying that's not consistent with the word of God? Oh, I'm broke. Well, you may be broke for a little while, but you don't have to stay broke. Amen? Uh, well, I, I've told this story on Pentecost. Some of most of you were here. A few of you weren't, but I'm not singling anybody out. But I just wanted to. My brother... The emotions of this are so hard because you let your emotions take over your, your speech. You take over your thinking. And take over. So my brother, who <coughs> I went to see and check on like on Thursday two weeks ago. Is it two weeks? Three. Oh, God, time gets about. Three weeks ago I went to check on him, and I go, my God, he's got to get to the hospital. And he just said he didn't want to go. And I said, okay. And I went outside. I just called the ambulance. And I said, come get him, and we got to talk him into it because he's got to go. So... They were awesome. They came in and they said, ah, man, you got some things that need to be checked out. We're here. We'll give you a ride. Let's just go. I mean, they talked. Next thing you know, we had him strapped on the gurney, and then we had him then. Hallelujah. He couldn't get away. We got him loaded. I told this story. My, my brother weighs about, he's about 6'6". Six, six. He weighs about four, three ninety, four hundred. 400. And so as he was getting out of the bed, he, the little EMT was about this tall, and, and he was going to st steady him. And he said, take your time. And get real steady before you try to move. Because if you fall, I'm toast. That's what he said. So <laughs> we'll have to take two of them. I have to have two gurneys to, the, to get him to the hospital. But anyway, we got him loaded. And we got him there. And uh, I thought I was relieved. And I thought, well, you know, they can figure out. They can help him. I prayed with him. Prayed over him. And I felt really good about it. I knew he needed to be there. He, he got over his, he wasn't quite as mad at me after he got there. And uh, anyway, that night in the middle of the night, he coded heart quit and we got a call early that morning and they said get up here we don't know if he's going to make it we've revived him but he's not stable my parents called me so I, I rushed got to Emerald as quick as I could and the nurse said he's, he's better a little better and the doctor came in a little later and uh, I said so the doctor says okay here's what's wrong this is not working this is not working this is not working and I said, so what do you tell me? He said, we've got one thing here we can try. If this doesn't work, then it's hospice. He's 55. My brother's just 55. And so when you hear those words right away, this, 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 this speech thing and this being bold in your faith and all, it gets really challenged. Amen? And so I said to him, I said, so are you telling me he needs a miracle? He said he needs three, to be precise. He needs three miracles. I said, well, the God I serve, if he can do three just as easy, he can do one. And he said, I said, I'm a praying man, and I believe in miracles. And he said, well, I'm a praying man, too. I believe in miracles, too. And if you're praying, pray for me, too, because I need guidance. Because we're running out of answers here. And so I began to pray. I came home to Carol. I was really distraught. And I said, you know, he's, it's bad. It's bad. The prognosis is bad. Well, is that your confession? You know. I said, well, we're going to speak. She said, we're going to speak. We're going to speak healing to him. We're going to speak. We're going to speak miracle, you know, three miracles to all the appropriate organs. We're going to do all that thing. And we just began to speak. And I told my, my family, he's negative. And I said, look, you believe whatever you want to believe. And the doctor's a good doctor. And the nurse, one of the nurses lives down the street from my mom and dad. And so my mom and dad called and said, well, what will it, is he going to be okay? And she said, it's going to take a miracle. And so I said, that's what I believe. I believe in miracles. I've seen them. I'm going to believe for another one. And so like two days later or three after 
they put a breathing tube in him. He couldn't breathe on his own. I mean, it was as bad as it can get. And so two or three days later, I call up there to talk to the nurse I, so I don't have to go up there. I can call the ICU nurse, and she will tell me, you know, how he's doing and stuff. And so I called her. I said I wanted to check on him. She said, well, do you want to talk to him? I said, I'd love to talk to him. And she said, well, call him on a cell phone. Okay. How do you talk with a breathing tube in your mouth? I mean, how is that going to work exactly? She said, call him. So I called him, and he answered the phone. I said, what are you doing on the phone? He said, you called me. I said, no, man. I mean, he said, oh, they took all that stuff out. I said, well, how are you feeling? He said, well, I feel kind of rough. They say I'm doing a lot better. I said, obviously, if you can talk on the phone. So I grabbed my stuff, and I went to the hospital, and I got in there. And the nurse came in, and I said, man, is he, he's doing better. She said, he's a miracle. All of his organs, spontaneously, all at once, started to work. But I'm here to tell you there were times when my confession and maintaining that faith-filled confession was tough. And, it, and I was worn thin. And I know a lot of you in here, I know you've been through some times when you've had to maintain a confession. Maybe it didn't even work out like you thought it would, but I'm here to tell you. We're in the season of breakthrough. And if we can begin to speak things, and if we can begin to believe things, we can extract order out of the chaos. If we can bring things to pass that make no sense in the natural, and we can call them good. And what God has done for my brother is good. Amen. I want you to stand. I want to pray for you. I want to re release an anointing. I want to release an anointing. I've never done this before. I want to release an anointing of awareness. An anointing of awareness of what's coming out of your mouth. Listen, if you can't say something good, just don't say nothing. Come on, somebody. Just don't say Because when you release it out of your mouth, it has power. It has authority. And the negative things you say are going to come to pass just like the positive ones. So if you can't say something positive, just hold your confession. Hold your mouth. Don't say anything. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, what I'm releasing now, Lord, what I hear your quickening is to release an awareness of our speech patterns and to understand that they have power and to understand that we'll give an account for every idle word. You know what idle means, Lord? That means that we didn't even think about it. We just said it. Help us to stop speaking idle words that are negative and to begin to enforce our speech pattern with the word of God and to bring that out of our mouth because we're in a special season. I release the anointing of awareness of our speech pattern and an anointing to create. It, it, we've always had it, but there's a heightening. There's, there's an amplification of that anointing in this season where we can begin to create things with our mouth that we have seen in the past. In the past decade, we had something you put in our heart that you showed us. We got to speak it into existence. That's all we have to do is speak it into existence. Believe in faith and we'll see it. And we thank you for the rain you've sent to our land. More's coming. We know that. We thank you for the prosperity that you've sent to our land. More's coming. We know that. We thank you, Lord, that you are doing something here. Every prophet that's come here from every part of the nation has said when they get here, he's doing something here. He's not doing everywhere. We know you're doing something special here. Help us to always remember that, Father. And now, Lord, help us to go forth and speak things into existence that you put in our heart. I praise you, Lord. I give you praise and I give you glory that you are the Lord over this land. And it's healed now in Jesus' name by the power of your word and by the power of your name and by the power of your Holy Spirit that hovers over it. In Jesus' name, we decree and declare it. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen hallelujah. Let's give God a praise, amen.